Hello and welcome everyone. Thank you all for taking the time to be here with us today. And thank you, Inakshi, and of course, Asia Society for inviting me to moderate this panel. Making businesses more sustainable actually starts with being aware of the issue at hand and of course, understanding just how important it is to make changes, both for the business as well as for the planet. As per the World Commission on Environment and Development for the business enterprise, sustainable development actually means adopting business strategies and activities that meet the needs of the enterprise and its stakeholders today, while also protecting, sustaining, and enhancing human and natural resources that will be needed in the future. Simply put, sustainability in business is the practice of operating a business without impacting the environment negatively. And John Elkington actually put this very well when he said that the triple bottom line, um, popularly known as the three Ps, he called it profit, people, and planet. So over the years, sustainability in business has actually come a long way from implying adherence to environmental regulations to fundamental strategic decisions that drive modern day businesses. Yet sustainable business is reaching the limits of what it can accomplish in its present form. It is slowing the speed at which we are approaching a crisis, but we're not necessarily changing course. Instead of tinkering around the edges of the market with new products and services, businesses must now transform it. And that is the focus of the next phase of business sustainability. And so today we are joined by three eminent industry experts, Ashish Pandari, Rajat Gupta, and of course, Puneet Lalbhai. And we're going to talk about sustainability in business, social responsibility as well. And I want to hear from them um, about the challenges they faced, as well as the opportunities for brands in the market and how they're leading with purpose beyond profit. So with that, I'm going to start off the panel today with a question for Ashish. And Ashish, I'd love to hear from you, you know, as markets pivot beyond traditional brand management narratives, we're hearing companies now integrate sustainability principles such as, you know, energy efficiency, or they're looking to develop green products. They're talking about carbon credits. Businesses are now being driven to adopt uh, sustainable practices in their operations. How do you see this transition? You know, what are the organization, what are the sort of organizational shifts that an enterprise could make um, towards more climate and environmental related goals that are more strategic for businesses? Hi, Shoka, and uh, thank you very much for having me here to the Asia Society and uh, everyone that's uh, present today as well for this evening discussion. We'll try and make it as informative and as open as I possibly can. Um, Shloka, I'll start exactly the way you started your pitch here. First, by start saying that it does not matter what business you are in. It is very clear that what is going to, what is the climate change agenda will change every business out there. Yeah, and it will change it fundamentally in terms of how you use energy, how you produce your products, what your consumers and your customers think about you, the supply chains that you influence. Um, and so it is not only the right thing to do, it is something that will be driven by the economics of the business as well. The timelines will change based on the industry you are in. But if you draw a line between now and 2030, you can be assured that every business will get transformed. And the question that most businesses then will have is that when does that change happen? What does it mean for me? And do I be influenced by the change or do I use this as a transition to, to lead the change and make this as an opportunity? So I think that is the question. And, and I would say most will come back and say, okay, I need to look at this as an opportunity. And that is something that is driving the agenda for most boards that I'm familiar with, including in India. Now, then let me take it to answer if you agree with the, this first fundamental premise in terms of things that companies can do and can do right now in terms of changing how they are looking at their business and what is possible and, and what is maybe a little less possible. For companies such as Thermax, which are in the business of making products, we have to completely change ourselves from being a company which is an engineering-driven company, talking about complexity of things to talking about 
what are the energy transition products and services that are needed and how do you start making those products and services very fast which means in areas like new energy hydrogen electrolyzers storage how do you take those technologies in how do you do partnerships if you are providing biomass based solutions how do you start investing in supply chains around biomass so that you can go to customers proactively and be able to say look just like you were assured of a 10 year supply of coal i can assure you a 10 year supply of biomass yeah and how do you go have those discussions with confidence with your customers if your customers were used to buying boilers that were running on 10 different fuels tomorrow you need to be able to go and offer them electric boilers and maybe the customer will be ready 5 years from now you need to start working on those products today so that you are leading the change in telling the customer i have an electric boiler for you it may be 20% more expensive but would you buy that compared to to a traditional solution you may be looking at investing in zero liquid discharge water solutions investing in base to energy all of these things that a technology company can do on the flip side you've got customers yeah your customers are a whole host of customers who are saying well if i do a change today it will be slightly more expensive but i'll give you an example of a customer who provides um without taking the name provides solutions or products that go into um into ikea into amazon into um walmart in the us and europe yeah and they are coming back and saying that the the clothing materials that i supply i am being told by my customers that in 3 years they have to be produced from renewable energy at least 80% plus otherwise you can't even supply me a product so many of them are seeing that even if they themselves are not responsibly thinking about it the ecosystem and the supply chain will force the customers to to do that the last thing i will say is that this is something that does not have to be a disadvantage managed well it can help india leapfrog a generation of technology and make this as a competitive advantage as you look to compare yourself with many other companies in the ecosystem compare with chinese companies or wherever the nature may be look at this as a source of advantage and not as a source of disadvantage so those would be my three opening bits i'm sure we will discuss this in lot more detail uh, during the rest of the discussion thank you thanks ashish i particularly love sort of the positive spin that you've taken that you know um the the fact about sort of needing to manage this well today and how it can help india lead fraud i think that's a really good sort of lens to apply the you know the sort of lens of opportunity as opposed to sort of the doom and gloom story that we hear around climate so very often i also appreciate that you're sort of you know talking about the need to move from ease of doing business to ease of doing climate you know we do need to solve tomorrow's problems today and you do need to solve or anticipate tomorrow's needs today so that's a really interesting approach and i think something that will be very useful for everyone to take away you know coming to the sort of flip side of it puneet i'd love to hear from you given your experience um what are some of the ways in which companies can actually mitigate climate related costs and you know uh, account for those risks in their value chain sure a uh, pleasure to be here um i think um you know it is uh, i'd like to start by sort of putting it out there that this problem is a very very large a uh, problem that you know isn't immediately solvable um by by sort of the status quo um so there and i agree with everything uh, ashish just uh, spoke about in that you know we'll have to think about doing business uh, differently in our sort of supply chain a lot of thinking has gone gone into this and one common theme um that is very different from from the past and in the past it used to be that you know consumers and therefore brands um set the tone of of what the market requires um and if the market required sustainability you know there would be a mandate 
uh, of sustainability that would come through the supply chain and suppliers would have to fall in line. Otherwise, uh, as mentioned earlier, they would risk losing business. Now, that sort of um, thinking and that sort of uh, top-down pressure uh, has led to some change. Um, but I would argue that that sort of change is not enough. So there was just a recent report. Um, and textiles, I think, is one of the uh, top. It's, it's definitely in the top five uh, sectors globally in terms of uh, its carbon footprint and its impact on, on as an industrial segment on, on, on climate change potential. The report said that if we do everything we're doing now, um, uh, we will only reduce, we will miss our science-based target uh, to keep the world's temperature below 2%, our share of it, our industry share of it by 50%. Um, if, 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 if we don't do things very differently. So, um, so that is the kind of challenge that is in front of us. And the only solution in my mind is a coalition approach um, where the problem is understood and where the impact is created uh, is very, very different. Um, the people that have knowledge to create the, the difference um, and the people that are willing to pay for it often are not on the same page. Um, so I'd like to give you an example of an initiative that I've been part of since its inception four or five years ago, uh, something called the Sustainable Apparel Coalition, where every um, um, major brand is represented, a lot of the manufacturing communities uh, represented, civil society is represented, farming communities are represented. So it's a really well-represented uh, group of people. What we did first is develop a common measurement for sustainability in the industry. And that common measurement, what we call the HIG index, became the standard by which you know, we, we talk about sustainability. And what it did was it created a positive race uh, uh, to, to, to actually improve. So by self-assessment um, and by um, sort of making your scores available uh, to your customers, um, we are able to you know, create a cloud of anonymous data to show where you are with respect to the industry. And that has really helped push the industry along. So year on year scores are improving. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, we are able to move away from greenwashing. Uh, we are able to, uh, uh, you know, uh, compare apples to apples. And we are able to have these conversations that are not, you know, drawing red lines that if you're below the score, I don't buy from you. It's a conversation around how do you improve your score year on year? Um, and every year, um, you know, you raise the bar. So every year, the HIG index, uh, it becomes harder to score the same number of points. And you went from really easy um, sort of yes, no kind of questions to actually a metrics-based system where, you know, it's getting more and more sophisticated. So you're taking the industry along. Um, so that was on measurement. But now we found that measurement is not enough. Um, you need collective action. And so the whole focus has changed to actually do uh, fundraising across the uh, supply chain. And I'm part of another initiative called the Apparel Impact Institute that is moving from collective measurement to collective action. Maybe I can talk about that a little later uh, in, in, the, in the program. So these were some of the examples of what industry uh, industries can do, not just individual industries, but entire supply chains that are very intertwined and, and, and sort of globally represented. Thanks, Puneet. I think you've made a very valuable point about the need for coordinated action. Um, and that is, you know, a very sort of, um, I think, promulgated approach now, you know, to mitigate against those climate related costs. Um, and of course, the initiatives that you've mentioned are very well known um, and, and they're seeking to do exactly this. I'm actually going to turn to you, Rajat, and ask you, you know, a similar sort of question, whether or not you have any thoughts around coordinated action, um, and if that sort of 
you know, one of the approaches that you would also suggest to mitigate against these kind of risks. But I'd also love for you to comment on um, something more around, you know, how companies can actually deliver change sustainably while benefiting the bottom line. Because, you know, when we talk about decarbonization, for instance, it's actually considered to be, you know, more of a hurdle than an opportunity. Um, you know, Puneet also referred to sort of the transaction costs of that transformation. So, you know, the challenges that sort of come forward with moving, you know, towards a more sustainable approach, can they actually reveal newer possibilities for profit? Um, would love your thoughts. I know it's a big question, but any thoughts you have? Uh, thank you, Shloka, and thank you for inviting me. Uh, let me try and, it's, yes, it's a big question, but let me try and answer a big set of questions, I should say. Let me try and address some of them to the point of coalitions. Uh, let me illustrate this in a different way. I think first and foremost, coalitions are going to be crucially important for the reasons that Puneet described, but also for other reasons. Whenever industries emerge, right, whether you take 100, 150 years ago, the emergence of the steel industry, or you take more recently, 30 years ago, the emergence of the mobile industry, for example, in India, they tend to be vertically integrated or created through coalitions. Less so through coalitions, they often are vertically integrated. So towers and service, for example, in telecom was vertically integrated, mines and steel making was vertically integrated because there is a vertical market failure, right? So no, a person can't put a mine because there's no demand for that mineral. And a person can't put a steel plant because there is no demand for, uh, there, there is no supply of mineral. And hence, uh, when industries emerge, and there are many industries that will emerge uh, out of this transition, uh, there is need for integration. Now, this transition is going to need capital in overall terms, and I'll come back to this question, in trillions of dollars, and each project could end up being in certainly tens, perhaps hundreds of billions of dollars. Let me illustrate a project, right? So a project of hydrogen, right, which is going to be necessary for high temperature decarb, high temperature heat requirements in industrial processes, and perhaps is the only way to decarbonize some, some sectors. Uh, now, you need large amounts of renewable energies for green hydrogen, you need electrolyzers to be set up, and you need newer technologies to use that green hydrogen than the current technologies, for example, for steel making or for some other uh, processes. Uh, a steel maker can't put the steel plant unless the hydrogen is there, a hydrogen maker can't put the hydrogen unless the renewable is there, and vice versa. Uh, so this does require huge amounts of coalitions, and some of these coalitions will have to be uh, cross-border coalitions. So the cheap hydrogen, or even the raw material for steel making, for example, um, uh, direct reduced iron, can probably be made cheapest in India, Saudi Arabia, Australia, where the sun shines hard, while the consumption centers are in different locations, um, perhaps in Northern Europe, or in Europe or in Northern Asia. And so many of these coalitions will have to be cross-border coalitions that have to get created for these kinds of new industries to emerge. So I think the coalition building is really something that has to happen at scale. The coordination has to be at scale or you have to have enterprises that can invest hundreds of billions of dollars in one go right, to make these things or certainly late tens of billions of dollars to make some of these projects uh, work. But if I just step back to your question of opportunity, I think Ashish talked about uh, the opportunity side of the equation quite a, quite, quite a bit. And if I just take this a little bit to the macro level, uh, this is probably when we look back at it 20 years from now, this, is, may, this may well be more of a story of opportunity than a story of uh, transformation of existing businesses. It may well be turned out to be that way. Um, and why do I say that? Uh, because if you look at, and this is recent work that the McKinsey Global Institute has done uh, on what will it take to get to net zero from an economic perspective, we'll require $9 trillion a year of capital investment in the next 30 years to get to net zero 1.5 degree pathway, uh, relative to $6 trillion roughly uh, of investment. This $9 trillion will have to be two thirds in low carbon technologies. Today, it's 70, 80% uh, uh, high carbon technologies. By the way, and I'm referring to this investment just in two or three systems. There's a land use system, there's the energy system, there's the mobility system that I'm talking about here, right? The major, these, the ones that matter in this conversation. So, uh, and this number is the number that I'm referring to, $9 trillion is 7.5% of the world's GDP today. The 
the number for India, that 7.5% number for India is going to be in the range of 11%, even more, because we are building India as we are. And um, uh, India does have uh, a higher concentration of those industries that put out more carbon or carbon dioxide. So, um, so the, 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 the point I'm making is that very large amounts of investment will come. What sectors will it come in? There are four types of sectors, which comprise about a third of the world's GDP. There's the fossil fuel producers, uh, which will have to shift their technologies to either biofuels, for example, or renewables. There's the industries that emit carbon, like cement and, and steel. There are uh, com country, car industries and companies that make products that pollute, car makers, automakers, for example, which of course have to transition to different, different types of products, electric vehicles. And then there are companies that embed carbon in the products that they buy uh, or raw materials that they buy and therefore in the products that they sell like textiles where the real consumption of carbon actually happens in the agri, agri chain. It's not carbon, but greenhouse gases in that case happen in the agri chain and so on. So there are the, these, these sectors variously combined up to about a third of the world's uh, GDP. And these are the sectors that are going to be the most impacted. They're mostly capital intensive and uh, you know, that again, I'll come back to this, but at the high level, there's three sets of uh, the nine, 10 opportunities that this opens up uh, for the world, right? So there's the trillion dollar sized opportunity, trillion dollars in the next five, seven years. So shorter time frame. Three of them are power, which everybody knows about, the renewables. Second is low carbon mobility, electric vehicles, or otherwise. Uh, and then waste avoidance, uh, circular products, or the use of waste. There's the half a trillion dollar set of opportunities around uh, uh, around things like waste management, the collection piece of the waste. Uh, there's low carbon food and agriculture and hydrogen. And then there are smaller opportunities which are important enablers like uh, carbon capture um, in some hard to abate sectors, carbon markets, uh, and industrial decarbonization of the kind that Ashish talked about, electrification of low temperature heat, for example. So nine opportunities that I've described at different levels. The third sets are more in the hundreds of billions of dollars as opposed to the trillion dollar opportunities that I was talking about. More about this later if there are questions. Thanks, Rajat. I think you've, you've summed that up beautifully. Um, and I think your point about integration actually blends seamlessly into my next question for Ashish. Um, you know, I wanted you to talk a little bit, Ashish, about how businesses can actually be managed com competitively and sustainably in an integrated global market. Um, Rajat referred to sort of the need for coordination at scale and, you know, really talked about cross-border coalitions as well. Um, I'd love for you to delve into that a little bit deeply when we talk about global markets. And also, can you get into a little more detail about how energy costs can actually be optimized to maximize profit while also minimizing the impact of business operations on the environment. It's a tricky, it's a tricky equation, but we'd love to hear, you know, what those possibilities are from you. Okay. Um, okay. Sorry, Ashish, just before you start, I do want to sort of request everyone to put their questions in the Q&A box. Um, I see that some are already coming through. So just a reminder of everybody. But oh, Ashish, over to you. Nice. So there are two questions uh, that you asked, and I'll try and answer both um, separate answers as well. Uh, the first one, which is on coordination, is completely agreed with Rajat and Puneet. That is the only way this will get done. And perhaps the one thing that I think India needs to do a lot more um, relative to companies in the West here, where if you take companies in the West, whether you take green steel, green cement, um, some of the big hydrogen projects that are going on, they're all being done under, with some support from government in terms of general policy support or whether it be some amount of viability gap funding, but they are all coordinated efforts across the ecosystem. And India too will urgently need to do these kinds of uh, joint efforts wherein the first effort may not even be with a specific like end price that this will produce hydrogen at $1 or at 100 rupees per kg. Yeah, The first one is just to see, help me understand the various building blocks of putting a solution together. That will then help me understand how do I optimize each part of it. And solar is a good example in that sense. Here, yeah, The kinds of solar prices we talk about today are unheard of uh, would have been unheard of even a decade ago. 
But a decade ago, the companies that invested in putting those solar supply chains are in some ways getting the benefit of some of those lower prices today, which India has kind of missed out on in a way. And we shouldn't let that happen to us on the hydrogen side. So completely agreed with, uh, with Rajat on, the, on this particular aspect. The second bit, which is on what companies can do to look at their energy costs and can that be, um, can that be making sense? I would say absolutely yes. Yeah, and there are three buckets that you can think of. And the first bucket is one where you need to start actually monitoring where your money is being spent itself. Yeah, so understanding, baselining, knowing where is, what is happening, where is it happening, every company should do that immediately. And we'll talk about scope one, scope two, scope three emissions, I guess, in some point. But knowing where your energy costs are going is something that, and your water is going, something that every company should start to baseline immediately. And a little bit of money that needs to be spent to understanding that is a no-brainer. The moment you do that, you will see that there is a fair bit of what is low-hanging fruit because the cost of energy today makes a lot of energy-saving initiatives very viable and they will make you competitive. And what is happening in the rest of the world today and the crazy pricing in, of coal, of oil, of everything relating to energy creates the opportunity. And while the short term will be painful, I do think long term, this actually helps the climate change uh, story because it creates uh, pricing, which gets a lot of people to think about in our business, more and more customers are thinking about biomass and bioenergy relative to what they would have done in the past. But the moment you do kind of the first one, you will see a lot of projects that are possible where um, you can get two to three year paybacks, even smaller. Our single biggest initiative um, for cement companies has been cement waste heat recovery. It's a two year payback. It's got uh, anywhere from 100 to 150 crores of investment, but it gives you 13 to 14 megawatts at a, at a price at which you get a two year payback on your investment and every company will look at that. Similarly, depending on your industry, there'll be a lot of low-hanging fruit. Then you get into the tougher projects where companies will have to be proactive because things there that are not making commercial sense today, a good sense of chunk of those projects will make commercial sense in a three-year window where the carbon costs will come into play, the customers that you have will demand um, are you producing energy? So they will become as barriers and requirements of entry to play. So you need to know what are those projects that you need to undertake, start to at least understand what will it take for me to do these and do that. And then the last bucket is kind of companies that want to be completely climate centric, want to do the right thing for the sake of doing the right thing. I don't think many companies in India will do projects in the third bucket, but the first two buckets after you do the baselining, absolutely yes. Thank you. That um, was so really guys, helpful. Can, you, can I can I come in? Rajat, please please jump in. So uh, let me paint a bit of a counter view. I fully agree with you with Ashish that there is a first set of projects which are in the money, so to say, solar and to some so to some extent, not fully because there's grid costs which are not captured today in the way solar is costed to the consumers. But there's a whole bunch of base heat recovery systems as an example. Whole bunch of things which are in the money today, great, superb. But I think there is a contra side to this, which is also an impeller for action, I think, for our companies, which is that there is a view, and I, I currently hold this view with the right to change it as I learn more, um, that costs, energy costs are going to go up. There are going to be two drivers for energy costs going up. The one driver is obvious. We need to get new energy systems in place. The technologies haven't yet reached that same cost position, so those have to be paid for, and therefore uh, the energy costs or prices that therefore have to be higher. But the other is that even gray energy costs are going to be higher, not because of today's geopolitics that hopefully is temporary, but because the way the world is moving, we are going to see uh, uh, underinvestment in gray technologies 
forced by consumers, forced by investors, forced by banks, and by the fear of us as the real investors, right? If I'm investing in a power plant today, even if there's demand for coal-based power or for power, I am going to think 15 times before investing in a coal-based power plant uh, because I don't know whether 10 years or 15 years from now it's going to get stranded because somebody's going to come out and shut it down, right? So I may not invest in that coal-based power. So meanwhile, there are going to be a fair amount of shortages potentially in, for example, energy. By the way, in material after material also, the same thing will apply. There are going to be a fair amount of shortages, not only impelled by demand that's created by the green world today or the green trend today, like for copper or lithium or nickel, uh, for batteries, for example, but also triggered by the underinvestment that's likely to happen in, in, in India, but also in the world, and, but also in India. Now, what is that? What is that? That's a big implication, right? I mean, $100, $150 crude oil because we underinvested, um, because you know we didn't quite keep up finally with the demand and the supply of the greener product. Uh, I think this is the difference between an orderly and an orderly transition. So coming back to the coalition point, it's not only going to be a coalition of businesses. It's got to be a coalition of business and government and civil society and consumers that's going to make this happen. I think point well taken, Rajat. And I think you sort of brought up again an interesting sort of piece of that sort of puzzle or, or chain, so to speak. Um, Puneet, actually, my next question is for you. I wanted you to just talk a little bit about the pressure from buyers to drive emission reductions in their supply chains. It's actually slowly trickling down from top to bottom. But how do companies actually empower their suppliers to become net zero through green financing? So I think this whole paradigm of, mm. you know, buyer and supplier has to sort of be rethought. Um, I think suppliers um, have actually the wherewithal and the knowledge to, to make this transition happen. Whereas buyers have, you know, the storytelling uh, capability. Um, at least I'm talking from, from my industry perspective. So we need to tell the right stories. We need to create the right incentives uh, and disincentives um, uh, encourage the right kind of behavior, but it can't be, you know, uh, a, a simply top-down uh, kind of uh, approach. It needs to be um, an, a sharing approach. Uh, just to give you an example, um, most of the carbon emissions uh, in a cotton apparel uh, supply chain happen at the farm. Um, and the link between the farm is the long tail of, of suppliers, many of which are small uh, and don't have, they have excellent knowledge, but they don't have uh, capability uh, in terms of finance, in terms of access to technology, in terms of um, uh, taking their, their products to market in the places where these kind of products will be, will be valued. So we need mechanisms where the knowledge residing with them, the knowledge that relates to um, you know, the upstream supply chain or the knowledge that, that, uh, that is very local, uh, how do we leverage that and how do we fill those gaps um, uh, and, 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 and enable them, empower them uh, to succeed? Again, the answer is in 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 um, in, in uh, coalition. So um, this is a place where I may talk about the Apparel Impact Institute. Uh, we have a model. Um, uh, one program that we do is mill improvement, um, and and the, that program um, seeks to have capital from a variety of sources. So one third is the responsibility of the suppliers themselves. Uh, one third. Uh, the brand, which is nominating the mills to this program, uh, actually come up with. And one third is uh, philanthropically uh, sourced, uh, making the sort of uh, uh, ability of many of these players um, uh, a lot better to, to invest in the kind of change that they need to um, uh, in, their, in their supply chain. So, so this is just, just one example of where it just can't be a trickle down effect, but there is you know, a lot of thinking that goes on in the industry to be able to move even a long tail of relatively um, uh, 
people who can't can't make uh, large investments in in change um i think one more point i'd like to add on the previous conversation um because it's i think it's very important i think there are two kinds of um opportunities uh, and situations one is a bucket of opportunities where actually thinking um positive climate is actually extremely possible uh, profitable so you know if you all your waste uh, saving um, initiatives all your um, sort of uh, initiatives such as heat recovery that ashish spoke about um uh, all all kinds of um uh, mechanisms that allow you um access to established technologies that actually make up um, make your production more efficient um that falls into one uh, bucket and that bucket is not insignificant or small the other bucket exists because one either things are mispriced two the players there is lack of information or or education three there is a lack of policy uh, frameworks that allow uh, you know uh, you know the change to occur so i think addressing these underlying things or uh, there are risks associated with technology um, uh, there is half baked technology uh, point rajat was making uh, earlier so i think going one level deeper and and addressing uh, each of these reasons why something is in the other bucket um, will require you know much more than just top down pressure uh, to to come in it's going to require conversations that will involve governments that will involve civil society that will involve the science uh, community that will involve the long tail of suppliers that will involve uh, you know marginal farmers so uh, how do we how the extent to which we are able to sort of get these very differing players around the table and solve their issues will determine uh, how well we succeed thank you puneet i think that was a really sort of well you know summarized response and i i really appreciate your pushing back against the sort of top down trickle and and sort of coming back to what you would sort of reflected on with the need for coordinated action that seems to be a theme for today's discussion but clearly an important one uh rajat i have two sort of questions for you because i think you can elaborate a lot more on sort of the coordinated piece i think there's there's a whole ecosystem sort of aspect that you've you've hit upon you know you've described the fact that action at scale is missing it's not happening fast enough we know that coordination between critical stakeholders is missing we're seeing a lot of great work happen in this country but it's happening in silos and that of course is a significant barrier to scale we know that if we want to scale up action in these incredibly diminishing timelines that we have we have to work towards bridging these gaps because we've all said this today that india is a key player in this decade of action and it's interesting because in the earlier days of the climate movement we actually saw a lot of effort being invested in building awareness about the crisis you know climate denial really was a thing at that time but i think we moved past it um we've seen significant investments in developing the science and research and today most major stakeholders from governments to central banks to the private sector recognize the importance and need to act on the crisis so now we really do have to move towards action and rajat you've mentioned that funding can of course play a critical role uh we know that the funding flow is currently limited you've talked about um the need for additional capital but can you also reflect a bit on catalytic capital um you know the capital that's actually going to move those levers that that are required to make widespread change whether it's policy or technology um the capital that's going to move private capital and markets um and focus on capacity building you know money really is the starting point to enable action i'd love to sort of hear a little bit more about you in terms of that enabling environment for business and and how catalytic funding can sort of move that forward and the second question really was around um it's sort of a follow on it's it's a little bit about you know in your experience what climate actions have the highest returns and specifically in the context of sustainability planning uh that companies you know are sort of rapidly deploying but i don't know if there's enough reflection yet on on sort of how we're building those out so those are the the two i keep coming to you with these massive questions but <laughs> over to you 
You're on mute. Sir. Yeah. Um, the first one is a very tough one. I don't know if I have an answer to it. Uh, but let me... Um, sorry, what was your second one? I'll start. I was going to start with that one. Let's start with that one, actually. It's a smaller one. It's more about sustainability planning that companies are deploying. And my question for you was really, you know, what are sort of the climate actions that have the highest returns? Yeah. So yeah. how best can sustainability planning be implemented? So look, I think uh, we've talked about many of those uh, in, in this conversation already. I think uh, if you look at the ones that have surpass any most energy efficiency, most time should say not any, but most energy efficiency measures like the waste heat recovery system in a cement plant, leakage prevention, steam traps, whatever, right? There's a whole bunch of things uh, that are in the money. A two-wheeler, uh, battery-based electric two-wheelers in the money about now or maybe in the next couple of years. Uh, of course, the grid also has to get decarbonized for that because otherwise it's not green. Um, but nevertheless, let's assume that happens solar in the money. Uh, so there are clearly some technologies, um, all efficiency-based technologies, re reuse of aluminum at a 60, 70% level. Aluminum that's, you know, there's only about two thirds or thereabout, 60% of the world's aluminum that, you know, comes out as product today is fresh aluminum. The balance of it is actually reused aluminum. Right. So there is a whole bunch of technologies that are out there that are so-called green te technologies, hydro-based alu virgin aluminum manufacturing in many parts of the world right, are in the money. So there's many, many parts of this chain that are in the money. Cars will become in the money, four-wheelers, for example, the electric cars, electric uh, uh, four-wheelers will be in the money maybe by the end of this decade, in, in, even in India. And, and I'm talking about being in the money from a from a full chain perspective, not just in the money after subsidy. This is before subsidies and, and, and so on. So there are many, many, many technologies. I mean, if, if you put a gun to my head and said, look, what does this add up to? It probably adds up to 20, 30% of the solution at this point in time of the total amount of reduction that has to happen. And even in, in implementing these, many things have to come together to the back to the point of coalition. Regulations do have to stimulate some markets in some cases, some supply in some cases and so on. And the match has to has to occur in some cases, consumer behavior has to shift uh, and so on. So I think it, it all needs to come together in a, some form of conversation. I think it's good, it's great, two, two decades worth of conversation in this topic. The last two years of really real focus has educated all of us and some of these things will move, move much faster. Uh, but there is still that 80, 70, 80% of the problem, which is either, a, a, by the way, just pure R&D is no longer a problem. And we did this work in Europe. Uh, Europe's 1.5 degree pathway on current technologies, including ones that have not yet been scaled, but currently developed technologies can be met pretty much, the 1.5 degree pathway. But these technologies have to be scaled, which requires many other aspects to come together, like I said, consumers, government, industry, financing, raw materials, et cetera, et cetera. Now, I, I, to your question of catalytic capital, I think uh, the biggest part of this catalytic capital has to go probably in three or four areas. And it's not very large amounts of money, right? I mean, compared to the, whatever, 9 trillion into 30 years worth to $270 trillion of capital that I talked about, this is probably a few trillion, right? Few ones of trillion. But it has to go in capability, uh, in knowledge de de development, it has to go and track and trace in ca of carbon. Carbon has to become like rupees and paisa or dollars and cents are today, right? You have to be able to track it. Puneet talked about it. You have to be able to track it through the chain because otherwise you, you can't price it. You can't hold people responsible for it and, and so on, right? So there is track and trace, which has to come to play. It's, it's, it, this is a catalytic in, uh, intervention. Uh, knowledge interventions like with banks, uh, for example, banks have to understand the risks of what happens if they invest in gray uh, now, gray, gray uh, uh, EBITDA or gray projects now versus if they invest too early in green projects. So they have to be able to understand that they have to be able to shape, they and others have to be able to shape regulations in a way that, um, um, that you know, some of these, some of these projects get de-risked today, right? Green projects which are risky today get de-risked and you are able to invest in that, which requires regulatory capability building also. So there are these three or four dimensions at a minimum that I can see of catalytic capital that would be needed uh, 
uh, in financial institutions, in the regulators, amongst companies, in the track and trace, and so on. Thanks, Rajat. I appreciate your sort of tackling both those questions. Um, I have two more questions, you know, one for you, Puneet, and, and for you, Ashish. I'll come to you, Puneet. So can I first. just make a comment on of what- Of course, please, please. Yeah, just, uh, um, just on funding, one observation more from the sidelines than anything is uh, climate change is a, is a world problem. Yeah, it is not good enough for Norway to solve its problems or for Japan or for Congo to solve its problems. The whole world has to, to solve it. And so part of the question on capital flows and availability of funding, um, one observation is there is that the biggest place where energy will increase is in countries in Asia and Africa. And that's where funding is most needed because that's where um, the cost of transition is the highest, but that's also the place where energy demand will increase the most. Whereas the capital is primarily cheap, capital is more abundantly available in the Western countries than any other place. So for that capital to continue to solve and continue to solve Western world's problems will not help the world at large. Yeah, that capital needs to move out of the West and has to reach projects all across the globe. And this is not just India, everywhere where there is growth of energy that's going to happen where transition needs to happen, that cheap capital, that green funding needs to find its way. That's it. Yep. I think a really important and relevant point, right? That there needs to be an equitable distribution of that capital, especially for those countries in that part of the world, specifically the global South, which is going to need to sort of transform uh, faster and quicker than ever before. Um, Puneet, I wanted to ask you about, you know, a growing trend that we started noticing, you know, conscious consumers, um, they're looking to make informed choices that impact the environment. And quite honestly, carbon is rapidly becoming the new calorie, you know, so are companies really doing enough to create systems of accountability and transparency um, to really empower their consumers to make low carbon decisions on how and where they should be spending their money? So this is an evolving landscape. I think um, we are in the very sort of messy part of it right now because there's a lot of um, half education out there which lends itself very well to greenwashing and um, sort of uh, you know behaviors that that go for that 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 suppose are proliferated for short term gain. Um, so I think that 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 cleanliness and um, uh, of, of, of this bit uh, will happen. Um, now it needs to happen um, at speed, um, which is because, because of the sheer urgency of this problem. Um, uh, we need systems to, 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 to be able to measure. Um, so ideally, uh, if I talk about my supply chain, um, you know, the effort is to make the Hague index consumer facing where, you know, it goes on a label and that number is, uh, inspires enough confidence where somebody can punch in that number and see the, you know, uh, impact across the supply chain. If you do that, then, um, you know, you are allowing the um, um, consumer to make a very informed decision. But people rarely make these informed decisions based on cold, hard numbers. So what is necessary on top of that number, um, which hopefully will get right uh, and in time, is also great storytelling. Um, we need great storytelling. People buy something because they emote. At least I'm talking about consumer-facing businesses. Yeah, um, they, buy, they emote to it. And, and you know... Uh, if I can know that this pair of jeans that I'm buying is benefiting some farmer in Vidar, um, and you know I have a photograph of his face, and I know that my purchasing decision is making his life better, and you know when I punch in that number, I see that you know the impact of that product is you know really in line with what it should be. Um, I think that that really enhances behavioral change, and I think behavior is. Is not just at the consumer level, but I think behavior is one X factor 
um, just because of the urgency needed and the short time we have to turn the ship around, I think behavior at all levels will need to change. Behaviors inside of organizations. Um, there is a lot of creative work happening around creating artificial carbon pricing uh, internally to, to change behaviors of managers in the way they, they run their, their factories, in the way they, they sort of transfer price internally. So I think behaviors within corporations is, is terribly important. I think behaviors between competitors uh, is, is hugely important. I'll give you an example. Um, Pre-competitive collaboration uh, is going to be the need of the hour for some of the uh, you know, technology problems that we need to solve. Um, Rajat spoke about circularity. I think you know, circularity is very close in, in, the, in the apparel supply chain. We have technologies that can recycle clothes back into clothes with virgin quality. But all that work is in the realm of startups and the risks that one needs to uh, take to go from lab to land uh, is, is where the sort of chicken and egg is, is happening right now. I mean, who will be the first to bell the cat and run the risks of you know, technologies that are not fully scaled yet, uh, yet time is short. So we need to create pre-competitive uh, collaboration to bring such technologies to life. So behaviors will need to also change um, uh, for, and not just at the consumer level uh, for this to, to actually uh, succeed. Thank you. Um, I actually think there's a good follow-up question to, to what you referred to um, from one of our audience members, and, and I'll come back to that. But I think such a brilliant point about you know the need for great storytelling. I always say that's the missing middle actually within the climate you know, peace, um, and especially sort of building out that India-specific narrative. I don't think we're really at that stage where we have, you know, cohesive cohesiveness or clarity around what that could be, but it's such a wonderful leadership opportunity, not just for India, but but for the global South as a whole. And of course, your point on behaviors, um, especially behaviors at all levels. I think that's that's a really sort of crucial nuance. We'll, we'll come back to that um, need because as I said, there's a question, a follow-up question, you know, that will pertain to that from the chat. But Ashish, I wanted to end my questions with you um, before we go to the audience Q&A. Um, I did want you to talk a little bit more about, you know, Thermax and your experience there because conserving resources, preserving the future is really sort of integral um, to your organization. Could you share how businesses across industries can you know, identify and calculate their natural resource dependencies, what tools and metrics and targets, you know, exist um, that companies can use to measure their impact on the natural environment? So Shloka, I think, um, and in the interest of time, I'll be brief. Um, today, there are a lot of well understood methodologies that exist for companies to benchmark where they are on a carbon footprint basis. Yeah, the simplest methodology is the scope one, scope two, scope three uh, emissions box, where scope one is your direct emissions, uh, emissions that go on in your factories, in your operations, transportation of your people, et cetera, which are direct. Scope two is emissions that you have as a result of um, electricity, steam, whatever you buy as bought out energy, the the energy footprint of that, yeah. So that becomes your um, your scope two. Your scope two is an in indirect emissions, but this is basically purchased purchased energy, purchased uh, carbon footprint of that energy. Uh, the toughest one is scope three, which is where you are looking at your products that you send into into usage by the value chains going forward. Yeah, the carbon footprint of that, uh, everything from use of the sold products, end of life, uh, processing of those products, transportation and distribution, all of that. So the methodology of scope one, scope two, scope three is very well understood. Scope one's um, easier to manage, easier to talk about, easier to measure. Scope two, also relatively easy to measure and monitor. And scope three, a lot tougher. Companies should start with this framework, start to understand what their energy footprint is, come up with plans on how do you reduce it, how do you improve it, and that will give rise to a whole host of plans. Simple answer, I think, just in the interest of time in terms of how companies can look at this. 
Thank you, Ashish. I appreciate that. And I, I appreciate you sort of um, shortening your answer for time. But we do have, you know, some questions for you from the audience Q&A. And I'm actually going to shift to that. Um, Rajat, I'll come to you first. We have two questions around the transition from green and ener gray energy to green energy. Um, and specifically, I think there's a request for you to elaborate a little bit more on the underinvestment around that transition. So, um, if you're a business person and uh, you're in one of these uh, hard to abate sectors, let's say, or may not even necessarily be hard to abate, but the sectors which which emit a fair amount of carbon. So coal-based generation, which is an obvious one. Frankly, no investments almost going in there. Only completion of current plants and some ground. Uh, some brownfield investment. This one, guys, okay, uh, there is shortage of power. Rajat, I think your internet is a bit... It's, crack, it's it's interrupted a bit. You know what we can oh, do is, only... Rajat, I'm sorry, can you hear me? I can, is it? Is yes, it... You, we, we lost you for a minute. Okay, uh, let me get but off you're back. for a second and I'll, okay. okay. So I was saying that you, you're, you're a company, you're not thinking of a coal-based power investment staring in front of you, an upcoming Indian demand growth for power, which is likely to be there. And on the other side, you have, Renewables, which are infirm power, one gigawatt is e of, of, of solar power is equivalent to 250 megawatts of, uh, of coal-based power. So you have to put much more of it. It may not come quickly enough. It's also infirm power, right? And it destabilizes the grid. It has to be stabilized with storage or other means. Now, at this point of time, the shortage facing you, what do you do? You, put, you, put, you will want to put as much money as you can into into, into solar and renewables, but there may be land-related constraints, permitting constraints. You may expect that the prices of solar uh, product, um, equ generation equipment, um, photo photovoltaic cells may come down. And so you may want to wait a little bit. The government may not want to uh, have all of it come right away. They may want some of it to come in five years from now. And yet there is potential shortages out there. Now, what do you do? Will you invest? Your bankers will come and tell you, particularly the international bankers, that we are not allowed to invest in coal-based power generation. So this is a this is a conundrum. How will we work through this conundrum where there are then likelihood of shortages of coal because mining investment may not go in, shortages of coal-based power, stable thermal power, uh, 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 metallurgical coal for um, uh, for steel making, and so on, and so on. And meanwhile, the green technologies haven't quite picked up at the same pace. So what is likely to happen? What we are likely to see a lot more volatility than what we've even seen in the last 10 years. It's already been quite volatile. We are likely to see a lot more volatility, a lot more uncertainty. And we are likely to, uh, we're likely to see periods of underinvestment, overinvestment that will occur around this. And... Let me turn to the implications of this for anybody who runs a company or runs a strategy efforts in a, in a company. This is classic strategy under uncertainty. So, you know, it's become really hard to now make decisions. How will you, some of you sit in boards, um, how will you make these decisions on boards, right? In this uncertainty, particularly when there's billions of dollars of capital that has to go into some of these projects. It's not... 300, it's not $20 million, right? And these are all capital intensive industries that I'm talking about. So this is the conundrum and this is the challenge. Of course, prices will go up. It's good if gray product prices go up, gray power prices go up, it will support more solar. So it's good for that to happen at some level. It's bad to happen because for our poor, uh, electricity costs will go up, not great, right? So many different dimensions to think about. Thank you, Rajat. Um, I think that was a useful summary. Um, and, and one is, I think I really like your point about the need for strategy in times of uncertainty. Um, but also, the, you know, this is where innovation as well stems from. So hopefully we'll see more of that as well. Um, Puneet, next question for you, actually. Um, I thought you could elaborate on sort of, you know, the behavioral piece that you were referring to earlier, but um, the question in the chat around Patagonia, actually, the outdoor clothing company, um, and one of our audience members has requested, you know, a little more clarity around the fact that they advertised that the fundamental reason for climate change was consumerism. 
Um, and the advertising that they did discouraged its customers from buying its products. And as a consequence, its sales jumped by 30%. So did the advertising succeed or did it bomb? So I would think, and see, this is my personal opinion. Um, the founders of Patagonia would have thought that it bombed. Um, if there is one company in the world, in our industry, that actually believes in that principle, it's Patagonia. And they are an inspiration to us all. Uh, and they drive a lot of the thinking around uh, this business. Um, so I'm sure that the, the founders of Patagonia would not have created this advertising with, an in, with a sort of hidden agenda of selling more, more product. Um, uh, just this is my personal opinion, knowing the company, being associated with them in, 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 in many ways. Uh, and they're thought leaders in, in the way that they, they think about sustainability. Um, they are very good at partnering across uh, the supply chain and with civil society. Uh, and they are very innovative in bringing new ideas to the fore. Um, I think a lot of this coalition work was sort of um, catalyzed um, with them being one of the core founding um, thought leaders there. So, so I, I would that that's what I have to say about Patagonia. Thanks, Muneed. I think I think that clarifies it quite well. Um, I also want to quickly respond to um, a quite, you know Anshuman, who's written in the chat. Um, I think he's followed our project to your response, um, and he wants to know if you know investment in ground form, you know, to move from gray to green, uh, would sort of ease that transition. And I think a quick follow up, you know, Anshuman is yes. Uh, that is actually something that we're doing at the ICC. So we are sort of we have a whole industry program, and one of the things we are trying to do is drive grant capital uh, towards some of these sort of transitional. Uh, transitional pieces. Rajat, anything you'd like to say on yeah, that? Yeah, I don't think grant capital is going to be sufficient, anywhere near sufficient at 10% of the world. No, 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 not um, not sufficient at all. Yeah. But I think, yeah, I'm, so, I'm going to put myself off video. I'm just saying lending mandates, carbon price, these are the mechanisms of scale. Yes. And of course, technology costs going down very significantly, which they can. These are the scale mechanisms. And I mean, grants and all of these be catalytic in nature. Completely. And I think I think you've sort of clarified uh, that point. It's never going to be sufficient, but there are sort of very catalytic levers that it can, you know, work on to produce that transition or to ease that transition rather. Um, so thank you for that. I think the last question, you know, Ashish, we'll come to you again um, to close us out for the day. But um, Amol has sort of put this down in the chat. He's, he's, he's you know, flipped the, the paradigm on its head. He says, today's solution can also be tomorrow's problem. And I think that's a very sort of wise statement. So how do we choose the optimum solution for sustainable transition in businesses while accounting for stakeholders and their operations, all stakeholders and their operations? Ashish on mute, yeah. This is to me, Shlup. Okay. <laughs> See, I think that's, in a way, the question is, is not just about energy, it's about life itself. Um, you're constantly on a treadmill. The problems that you create uh, today will, uh, the solutions that you're looking, and I perhaps it's, it's, a, it's a talk about how you work on EVs, and, and then you have a question on how do I dispose of all the batteries. I do, um, I do solar panels and some of them will have arsenic and, and the metal usage that goes about the water that it all needs. I think if we think about trying to solve everything today, day zero, sometimes it's difficult to take a first step itself. Yeah, so, and we know as we take our next step and our next step, you expect that some of the problems that you're creating, technology will continue to find solutions around it. How do you recycle batteries effectively? How do you uh, take metal out of all of this? How do you conserve it better? How do you run electrolyzers with, with recycled water? So we, will, uh, we have to give technology a chance. Um, I think the whole climate change one, in a way, to, to not belittle it by any means, but will also going to be a case of 
jumping off the cliff and growing our wings as we are jumping down. Uh, but the choice is is not there yet. Yeah? It is something that we have to move forward on because we know what we have today is not going to to be anywhere close to to saving the planet. So so we all have to start down, and then you have to have faith in in humanity and technology that we will figure some of the answers to the problems that we are creating uh, based on today's technology. Thanks for that, Ashish. I think that was, you know, really sort of well summarized. Um, I think we have one, la- we have like a minute for like a last quick sort of question. And it's actually for both you, um, Ashish and Rajat. And the question is, and Puneet, for you as well, if you have thoughts about this, but they want to know what is the likely time frame for a complete change over to green energy? <laughs> <laughs> I thought that would be a nice to one this. to end on, yeah. <laughs> Ashish and Puneet have the answer to this. Not soon enough. Sorry, Ashish, what did you say? Just say not soon enough. Not soon enough, okay. Uh, Rajat, are you, are you abstaining from this round? I mean, it's anybody's guess. Uh, yeah. I do think that uh, we will, uh, let me say that we will probably solve the problem faster than we think today is possible. I don't think anybody thinks it will get addressed by 2050, probably here. Uh, But I think whatever we may think, we probably, because I mean, human endeavor is infinite and innovation is infinite. And we, and this flywheel of learning, uh, and as long as the pressure stays up and other distractions like last week's don't come in the way, uh, I think, and maybe even a pandemic or two don't come in the way. So I think if it stays up, we'll probably solve the problem faster than we today think it's solvable. Right. Okay. I think that's a nice way to end it. Puneet, anything from you? No, I agree with uh, Rajat. I think it will be faster than we think. Uh, okay. But I worry about whether it will be fast enough. Uh, and yeah. that, that should be an impetus for all of us to do our bit. Thank you for that, Puneet. I think, you know, succinct and very clear in terms of a call to action. Um, I do want to you know, thank all three of you for being here today. Um, you know, I think what's, what's sort of very clear from your conversation and your insights is that effectively becoming more sustainable is not going to be easy at first. But of course, the challenge is well worth the reward. I think you've all hit that drumbeat quite you know, um, innumerably throughout this conversation. And I think you've also explained quite effectively that business sustainability will actually compel more systemic business strategies. Um, And it's going to really challenge traditional ways of conceiving of business, you know, itself. Um, I think all three of you have reflected, you know, quite brilliantly on some very difficult questions today on business sustainability. You've talked about the need for coordinated action at scale, the cost of transition and who bears that, what can be done to ease it, how businesses can do more effective and sustainable planning. Um, what is the scope and potential of opportunity, obviously, for this for this transformation? You know, really the big the big question. Even as we acknowledge, you know, that the financial gap is significant. Um, so, you know, I think throughout this conversation, though, what what you've all repeated is that changing the way we do business is essential to addressing the challenge um, of environmental degradation before us, and quite frankly, the extinction of our own species. So. I really thank you for your insights, your time today. I also want to thank our audience um, for being here with us today, for sharing your evening with us. Thank you for your interest, of course. Um, And, um, you know, I really want to acknowledge the Asia Society team because none of this would have been possible without Anakshi and all of you. So, you know, a very, very warm thank you to all of you that were instrumental in bringing this event to life. And thank you once again to our panelists for your time, your effort, your learnings. Um, It's been a fascinating conversation. And of course, to our audience, thank you for being here. I hope, you know, you have a wonderful day or night ahead, depending on where you are in the world. Thank you for joining us. Thank you.